Welcome. My name is Patty Clapper. I'm a member of the Picking County Board of County Commissioners. I'm going to be moderating today's COVID-19 community meeting. And I wish to welcome all of the public who is participating um, by Zoom or watching us on Grassroots TV. And um, I want to introduce very quickly the speakers. We have quite a list today. We have Sam Landercasper from Picking County Health and Human Services, Joss Vance from Picking County Public Health Epidemiology, Dave Ressler from Aspen Valley Hospital, Larissa Dandenau from Picking County Public Health, Jordana Sabella, also with Picking County Public Health, CJ Oliver the, uh, with the City of Aspen Health Protection Team, Joanna Coffey, Brian Doherty, and Tucker Valton from the Consumer Protection Team, Rich Berkeley, Steve Howard with the Aspen Skiing Company. So we have quite a packed agenda here, um, so I'm ready to get us going. But before I want to just mention to the public, the I Wear a Mask campaign will have a landing page on the website. It's to be launched next week. It's where people can send in their own mask selfies and, and including a few words about why they think it's important to wear a mask. So we encourage the public to participate in this new program because it shares with the rest of the community what people are doing and the efforts that are being made. So I'm going to kick off first with Sam Lancaster from the Human Health, Health and Human Services Department. So Sam, the floor is yours. Thanks, Patty. Um, I'm going to see if I can get my screen sharing here. Let's see. Okay, is everybody seeing um, our covered title page for Picking County Human Services Mass Care and Shelter? Yes, we are. All right, great. Um, so today we just wanted to talk a bit about um, human services and the services that we've been providing since the onset of COVID with kind of an eye towards the economic impact. Um, and starting out, just want to highlight our, our normal quote unquote human services function. Uh, we have our senior services, which provide meals, uh, transportation, uh, programming for older adults in Picking County. Uh, we have our protective services with adult and family services. So these are prevention and intervention programs for um, adults and children who are uh, experiencing um, uh, issues. We have our economic assistance programs, which are various programs, um, <clears throat> including food assistance, Medicaid, um, child care assistance, uh, various financial assistances, our veteran services programs, um, helping our veterans with uh, claims with the VA as well as connecting them with community resources. And then the Healthy Community Fund, which is a $3 million uh, mill levy funded program to provide our social safety net and helps provide um, grant funding to a lot of our local nonprofits. So under um, you know normal circumstances, these are the programs that Human Services is, is working on for the community. However, under COVID, uh, obviously our uh, programming expanded quite a bit as we are um, tasked with um, mass care and shelter, um, so meaning ensuring safe and adequate shelter and housing, uh, providing food and supplies uh, in mass care events such as uh, um, disaster pandemic response, coordinating our mental health response uh, as well as uh, organizing those resources, also supporting people with access and functional needs. Um, access and functional needs is a term used for folks who are over 60, um, possibly disabled, disenfranchised, homeless, unemployed, people who are experiencing um, difficulty thriving in, in um, you know, everyday situations. Uh, also enhancing youth, family, and individual well-being. And then during all of this, maintaining the continuity of all of our normal services, which obviously saw major impacts um, because of the increased demand um, that we were seeing. We just wanted to highlight really quickly some of the community partners who we've been working with in this response. Um, you know, this obviously isn't a complete list, um, but we just wanted to recognize that this is a complete community effort um, responding to this, and we certainly wouldn't be able to do the work we're doing without help from um, so many of our partners here in Picking County and throughout the region as well. A lot of these efforts have been have gone beyond the, the borders of the county, certainly, in this response. Uh, first thing we wanted to look at um, and talk about was 
in response to COVID was our, our SNAP program, which is a supplemental nutrition assistance program. Uh, many folks know this as food stamps. Um, obviously, with the onset of COVID in March, we saw a major increase not only in applications, but also our caseload, um, which also results in um, a lot of funds coming into Picking County. So just as a quick overview, if you're looking at the top chart that shows our SNAP caseload over the last four years, um, those gold bars in April, May, and June represent our current active SNAP caseload, which is just under uh, 350 cases right now. Um, and I believe there's around 500 individuals within those cases. I have to look at the exact numbers to be sure. We also saw major increases in our applications. So our staff, we have um, currently have three technicians who are processing applications. So on average, we were seeing around, um, you know, about 30 applications per month. Um, during the peak time during COVID, we were seeing um, upwards of 100 per month. So um, just a very big increase in our workload. The good news is, is that getting um, these folks enrolled in the program, uh, the increase in our, our issuance, so meaning the issuance, the amount of funds going out to the community, increased from about 30000 a month um, in March to over 90000 per month in April through June. So we've seen an issuance since March of $300,000 plus in SNAP benefits um, when in 2019 in the whole year we issued around three, 375000 So the good news there is that this, these, these funds are going directly to folks who are in need um, to help them purchase food, and then a lot of that shopping is being done locally. So we're seeing some of those federal funds being infused to our local economy through this program. So we've really been trying to encourage SNAP enrollment. A lot of our community partners are helping us with this. Um, and with the federal unemployment benefits dropping off um, as of right now, we'd like to see, you know, folks taking advantage of this program and getting enrolled while they can um, to help bring in that additional income wherever possible. Uh, we also wanted to talk about unemployment data. Obviously, um, in a resort economy, that has a, a big impact. It also impacts how uh, folks are accessing the programs um, for the Human Services Department. So if you look at the map of Colorado on the right, you'll see that, you know, these resort, our resort economies are some of those being most hard hit by unemployment. Um, in Picking County, we are a little bit higher than um, our, our neighboring counties of Garfield and Eagle County, and obviously much higher than the uh, statewide unemployment rate. Um, it continues to be high even after peaking out in April. Um, another bit of information that we received from the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment that was interesting um, and, and good to be aware of is the uh, labor force information. So meaning you can see here the number of our uh, residents who are unemployed, our ongoing unemployment rate, and just showing that this is a significant portion of our population that currently is, is out of work. And with those unemployment, extra unemployment benefits running out, we're gonna have a lot of folks who are gonna be experiencing difficulty with their um, shelter needs, their food needs, um, utilities, uh, a lot of uh, areas of their lives are gonna be impacted. So in response to the um, major change in unemployment in March, we were fortunate to be able to stand up the COVID emergency relief program. Um, this was modeled after our um, emergency assistance program that was funded by the Healthy Community Fund that we've had since 2009, which provided assistance to folks who are struggling with meeting their uh, financial needs. Um, we obviously changed this um, a bit because of the situation, and um, we were able to successfully get funding. Uh, Picking County provided funding, City of Aspen, Town of Snowmass Village, uh, Aspen Community Foundation, and um, over the course, we just shut the program down at the end of June. So from mid-March until the end of June, uh, two point, nearly $2.3 million um, in assistance was approved uh, to be issued to folks who needed help paying their rent, their mortgage, um, various other things that were being impacted by COVID. Nearly 3,000 unduplicated individuals received assistance. Um, 
over 500 households with children under 18. And, you know, the, we were able to work through 4,091 applications for assistance. So that just kind of goes to show the need that was out there. 4,000 different um, individual applications were submitted. And we were lucky to have help from not only human services uh, departments that didn't work with this program normally. We had help from the library, clerk and recorder, uh, finance, bits. Um, the Aspen Skiing Company was able to help us with this because of the massive amount of approvals and screenings that needed to be done to work through this program. So if you look at the data we have here, um, you can see where the issuance was um, was handed out by, uh, as far as municipality goes. The issuance type I think is interesting. Obviously, for the most part, shelter was the, the large one that folks are worried about. I think that's something we're still going to see moving forward. Um, and then, you know, our big months were in April and May. Um, this was during a time when people hadn't yet received their unemployment assistance. So folks had lost their paychecks, you know, in the middle of March, towards the end of March. And there was a chunk of time there where people weren't getting any income coming in. And this is when we saw the biggest demand on this program. So looking forward um, with these unemployment benefits ending, um, you know, we hope not to see quite this spike as we know some uh, a good portion of people have been able to go back to work. But we do expect to see an increase in demand moving into July and August. So with that information, that was a lot of the response to the initial COVID outbreak and the closing of businesses and um, the shutdown. Uh, we wanted to look at um, our recovery and focus moving forward. So as a department, we are working to support the public health goals and objectives. We want to make sure that there's sustainability of our programming, all of these good programs that have been set up in the initial response. We want to make sure that they're able to continue. Um, we want to ensure individual and family economic stability, as well as focusing on our high risk and vulnerable populations. Um, in order to have a good idea of what we might be looking at moving forward, we conducted a survey with all of the um, folks who provided an email address when they applied for the COVID relief program. That was around 2,500 people that we were able to send a direct email link out to asking for their response to a number of questions. Um, overall, we received about 242 responses as of yesterday. So we were really happy to get this information. And we really wanted to look at what is gonna be the need moving forward. Because as of right now, the COVID relief program through Picking County is not accepting applications. Um, and our community partners, such as the school resource centers, as well as Catholic Charities are handling a lot of these uh, requests for assistance. So we wanted to be able to provide them with information and also look at how our program worked, um, some of the demographics around that. So what you're seeing here is some of our demographic info. It tells us where the respondents lived, um, ages, looking to see if folks have gone back to work. Um, you know, the good news is we're seeing that a substantial portion have returned back to work. Um, and then also looking to see, you know, who feels that they maybe still need assistance. So there is a substantial portion of the population that even if they are back at work still feels like this, that COVID has impacted them to the point that they still do need assistance. So we know the demand is out there and is likely to increase. Um, we also gathered a little bit of information about in which industries people were working. Um, I think a lot of it is not a surprise to, to anyone. Uh, but we did want to see generally where that impact is, and obviously it's in the hospitality, dining, um, you know, ski operations, the tourism aspect of our of our economy. So I think we already knew that, um, but it was still good to, to see that that information is um, still relevant. And then we talked to folks about what their outlook is of their current situation and moving forward. We wanted to see how people felt about where they are right now, what the future holds for them. Um, you know, did this program meet their needs? Um, and, uh, you know, we see that folks are a little bit uh, more optimistic about their housing stability than they are about their financial stability. Um, looking at questions five and six, um, that's where you'll see that. And then we also wanted to ask people how they felt about their, their employment situation moving forward. 
Um, and as you can see, the majority of people uh, were feeling that they're worried about what their employment's going to look like moving forward. Um, you know, probably just doing some quick math here, um, about 70% of the responses indicate that people didn't feel like their employment would be going back to the level it was before COVID. And um, then we looked at what are, what are people doing um, in response to this? So asking, have you attended or do you attend the food banks? Um, have you applied for, for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program? Uh, something worth noting there is that 18% of the people, even though with a lot of messaging about the SNAP program with regard to COVID relief, there's still 18% who don't know what that program is. So making sure that, you know, we can, we can get people in touch with those benefits is very important. Um, we asked what type of assistance they felt best met their needs. Um, in most cases, it was the shelter and asking if folks applied for unemployment benefits. So as you'll see here, 64% of the folks applied and received unemployment. Once again, going to this issue of the extra um, weekly payments going away and what kind of impact that's going to have on our residents and the economy here starting next week, really. Uh, we were also um, working with our community partners. Um, we were able to stand up a number of food pantries um, so what you'll see here is we have food or meal information from the senior center. Uh, we had a food distribution at Aspen High School and Basalt Middle School and then one in Snowmass Village. So um, the senior center has been delivering meals and having folks pick up lunches from the senior center since uh, they, they shut down. Uh, Aspen High School and Snowmass Village are mobile pantries managed by Aspen Family Connections that have been going on Aspen High School's weekly. Snowmass Village has been bi-weekly. Um, and then the Basalt Middle School Pantry has been managed by Aspen Skiing Company, and that's been weekly. Uh, most of the food is coming from Food Bank of the Rockies. And then starting next week, the Aspen and Snowmass Village pantries are going to be combined into one that's going to be housed at the Buttermilk uh, parking lot. So. Um, as you can see here, we've had pretty consistent um, access to these, to these uh, food resources throughout the entire response. Generally, it's around 1,500 households per week that are coming through these pantries. We haven't seen any major downturns. So um, our goal as an organization is to make sure that this uh, resource is stabilized and is, is there for the duration of this response, uh, making sure that people are able to access this. And, uh, we're lucky to have such great partners as Food Bank of the Rockies and Lift Up to help make sure that those uh, food resources are available. Sam, you need to start wrapping uh, up, please. All right, I think I've got <laughs> two left. Okay, so, perfect. Um, right here, we've, <laughs> we've got social supports for older adults. So the Senior Center has really shifted their programming to make themselves accessible in a virtual format, uh, making sure that people aren't suffering from isolation, making sure that folks who maybe aren't as mobile, are able to get uh, food delivered to them as well as groceries, and are able to make um, trips out for uh, appointments, medical appointments, things like that. Um, a lot of their information can be found on their website, which is on here, and that's a great way for people to connect. And then going back to um, our homeless and um, our AFN access and functional needs population, um, in response to the increased needs we were seeing, um, case management has been expanded. So if you look at the bottom graph, that's what we're, these are AFN, so Adult Access and Functional Needs Referrals. Um, as you can see, there have been some pretty substantial spikes in April and July. And um, at this time, the entire Adult and Family Services team is responding um, to, to these requests, uh, helping with case management, um, making sure that um, non-congregate shelter is available for folks who maybe are homeless but need to isolate um, due to uh, COVID um, quarantine. And then also the establishment of the safe and outdoor space at the intercept lot, maintenance of that, making sure that the services that are necessary are available to those folks and that it's a safe place for people who, who don't have a, a place to live right now. And uh, 
that, that's all I've got. Thank you very much, Sam. We appreciate it. That's a lot of good information. So next we have Josh Vance with Picking County Public Health Epidemiology. Vance, the floor is yours. Okay, um, so I'm gonna to touch on our current numbers uh, and then Dave Ressler is gonna jump in after me and give an update on the hospital. Perfect, thank you. So right here we have, um, these are our current cases that have been reported, I'm sorry, not current cases, our total cases that have been reported since March. Um, you'll notice again, as we've just discussed in the past, we had a peak here in April, cases went down and now we saw a peak here in mid-July following the 4th of July holiday. And now we've begun to see a slight decrease in cases, but we're still seeing a, a heavy amount of cases being reported each day, um, on average about two to three. Um, this red line here is our 14-day uh, running total of cases. So at any given point, it'll tell you how many cases we've had in the past 14 days. So if you look at today's total, we've had 31 cases reported over the last 14 days, and that's remained pretty consistent over the past week or so. In total, we have 164 cases, and since July 13th, our contact tracing team has reached out to 185 people um, to discuss uh, potential exposure to COVID-19. This is a similar graph just showing you the cases by their date of symptom onset. What I wanted to highlight here is that this blue line here is July 4th. You'll notice that we had a, a lull here with not many cases. Following July 4th, we began to see a, a, a slight increase in cases, a, a pretty significant um, you know, uh, a curve here. Um, and then it's, it's sort of curving down again as well, but we, we really don't know about this time period right here. We're still waiting for those reports and these might, these might increase. But I just wanted to point out that, you know, the, these main holidays, those major, major holidays seem to be pretty significant in terms of disease transmission. And we saw that here in Picking County. Um, these are cases by city in Picking County. Um, so of course, Aspen is, is seeing the most, uh, most cases by sheer number. Um, we've had 20 reported in Stonemass Village, 14 in Basalt, and then the rest of our cities have seen um, less than five cases um, in, in total since the beginning of the pandemic. Looking at cases by employment status, and I don't want this one to get confused, this isn't where the people were exposed, this is where they work um, or, or where they state that they are, their employment is. Um, we consider or uh, included retired here um, in, this, um, in this metric. Um, that's the, the highest percent is that individuals who are retired um, appear to be uh, most affected here in Picking County by, by COVID-19, which mimics national and, and worldwide data and showing that older people um, tend to have higher risk factor for COVID-19. Um, restaurant and grocery was, was a closely followed retirement as did retail and hotel. Um, and so we're seeing a significant number of, of individuals who, who work in those sectors who are being infected, whether that occurs there or, or um, outside of the place of employment. And then the last thing I just want to touch on real quick is there's a lot of research going on right now um, and a lot of interesting findings are being presented. And so I just wanted to share this one with the community. Um, this was a, a study done in Germany. Um, they looked at 100 patients that had COVID-19. Um, they looked at um, their heart while they were infected. And then um, about three months later, they looked at um, their heart again uh, to determine if there was any sort of impact to their heart. And what they found is that in 78 of the patients, um, of those 100, they noticed that they had abnormal um, findings, meaning that they were finding some sort of damage done to their heart. Um, some of them were, were less severe, some were more severe. But on average, when you compare this to um, people that did not have COVID, which is the individuals down here, You'll notice that these individuals had higher levels of, um, of heart damage than those who were the control group. Um, so I, I just wanted to point this study out. It's just one study. It was a small study. Um, you know, I don't want to generalize it to our entire population, but it, you know, we are finding a lot. Uh, we're, we're finding a lot more out about COVID-19 and, and maybe the chronic and long-term effects that COVID-19 can have. Um, and so I think it's important for us as a community to really stay on top of that and, and to be mindful of. The, the fact that while this impacts people in the acute short term, it's also having long-term effects on individuals as well. Um, and so it's important for us to, to really keep on the data and, and, you know, and the research and to really understand the, the long-lasting effects that COVID may have. So I'm going to hand it over to Dave Ressler. Thank you, Josh. Uh, so I'm uh, 
as Josh mentioned, I'm going to talk to you about the hospital status. And we have some good news to share uh, today, along with a word of caution at the same time. The good news is that, as you can see, this is a screenshot of the current uh, website and the matrix that we maintain on that website indicating the status of our hospital capacity. And you may recall that back in June, we increased or escalated our status on the far right column from comfortable to cautious. And so we had a yellow cautious in that middle category of average daily visits. And as we discussed on uh, our previous uh, community forums and in other uh, opportunities, that was specifically related to one of the three types of services that we provide in that category, uh, which is community testing. So as you can see, we look uh, to uh, a threshold of 16 or less community tests indicated by the uh, abbreviation CT. Um, and for the period of time uh, back in June and early and mid-July, we were exceeding that on an average daily basis looking out over 14 days. Uh, however, for the last 14 days, we have been below uh, 16 tests to our uh, community testing center here at the hospital. And uh, for that reason, we were able to return back to comfortable with the understanding that our uh, respiratory, uh, we still call it the tent, it's now indoors, but the respiratory tent, or what we call the respiratory evaluation center, has been running less than 10 per day, and our emergency department is continuing to see less than six per day on average, and we look at 14-day rolling averages. The cautionary note that I want to offer, however, is that we are just below uh, these threshold levels, particularly with our testing. We're still testing uh, 13 to 15 patients a day, um, and so we're not far below this threshold. And our emergency department has seen an increase uh, we were seeing about one to two um, highly symptomatic patients, and now we're seeing three to four on average uh, per day. So we certainly don't want to send the message uh, of complacency because that is far from the uh, reality. Let me talk a little bit more uh, on the next slide, Josh, if you would please, about testing itself and what we're seeing there. This is well. Thank you, Josh. You have a snapshot from the website. Many of you are observing this, I'm sure, on a regular basis, if not daily. And uh, there's some good news in this chart as well. You can see for the weekend in July 26, that is the last data point on the x-axis of the graph. Um, and the important line to look at here uh, is the yellow uh, positivity trends on a 14-day rolling average. And you can see that it actually decreased um, in that last week to, if you, if you hover your um, pointer over that data point, you'll see that we're down to, uh, I think it's 6.3%. So uh, over, a, oh, pardon, 6.63% over a 14-day uh, rolling average. That's good. That's uh, dropping down um, from what we were concerned about, which was, as you can see, we were approaching the 10% mark. If you hover over each of the data points for those preceding weeks, you'll see uh, ranges from 7, 8, 9%. Um, overall, over the course of our testing, um, over the months now, we're at about 7% overall. But again, over the past few weeks, we have been approaching 10% which would indicate uh, a concern both in terms of the amount of testing being sufficient uh, and the um, rate of the viral spread. Josh provided much better data about that a minute ago. So from the hospital standpoint, from a capacity standpoint, uh, at the present time, we're comfortable. We don't have a single patient in the hospital today. We had one that came in last night into the emergency department by way of example, that was sent home with a negative test. Um, so we are not seeing the spike in the hospital that we've been concerned about 
culminating from the information uh, Josh was conveying about the 4th of July holiday and the positive test results that followed that. We were concerned that a couple weeks, we're now entering four weeks, uh, post that period of time, we would start to see a demand or a surge in demand on hospital services. And I'm happy to say that that hasn't been the case. So what does that mean? We believe that uh, we are doing the right things as a community, and this is a message to double down and not back off. Don't let off the gas. Thank you to the city for creating uh, the zone, the mask zone. Thank you to all of you for adhering to the five uh, commitments to containment, keeping your distance, keeping your face coverings on, uh, washing your hands, staying home if you don't feel well, and getting tested if you, if you're, if you and your physician think you might have COVID. It's working. The other part that's working is what Josh just explained, the containment, the boxing in strategy, the tracing process. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you to all of those hardworking people over at Pickens County Public Health, our partners. And thank you to our community members. It's working. Let's keep it up. That's the message. Keep it up. Keep up the good work, and we are going to be able to sustain uh, our ability to keep our community thriving without imposing uh, too much demand or surge in demand on the hospital. That's what it's all about, and ultimately saving lives. So let me talk a little bit more about uh, testing, because that is your reading about in the state uh, and national media. Uh, is also a local dynamic, and that is because of the surging number of cases in communities across the country, uh, particular states across the country that we're reading about, Texas, Florida, Arizona, et cetera, um, testing has become uh, a limited uh, availability for all of us now. So we are working, and this is the good news, our three counties have always been partnering around public health pick in Eagle and Garfield counties. And similarly, the four hospitals in these three counties are working with our counties and with each other to develop and implement a regional testing strategy that is consistent among all of us, all of our communities and all of our hospitals that are providing testing and other sites that are providing testing uh, as well in these communities. And so we are focused on symptomatic testing. We have rapid tests available at the hospitals, but we are reserving these because they're in the most limited supply. We only receive so many supplies to support our testing in the hospitals um, for those patients that are the most symptomatic and, the, and those patients that are referred by the county as being critical to containment, like in outbreak situations. That is where we are reserving our rapid test for. Uh, up until a couple weeks ago, all of us hospitals were providing those tests more liberally for anybody that had symptoms, and we just can't do that anymore. We are instead utilizing send-out testing, or in our case, saliva testing, for those individuals that are asymptomatic, that are traveling, uh, or think you may have been uh, around somebody that was positive, um, but if the county determines that you have been exposed in the tracing process, uh, you will be referred to us for that testing, and when appropriate and requested by the county, we may use a rapid test for those. Otherwise, it will be the saliva test. So please, if you are traveling or you have other reasons to be tested, there are many, talk to your physician, receive a referral to Aspen Valley Hospital. If you don't have a physician, contact our um, primary care practice, uh, particularly if you have symptoms, and we will schedule to have you come in uh, and get tested. And again, I'll conclude with in a manner consistent with all of the hospitals um, in this region. That's from Rifle to Vale to Valley View uh, to ourselves. So that is my update for today. I believe I've used all my time and I appreciate <laughs> it. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Dave and Josh. And you guys actually gave me one extra minute, so I truly appreciate that. Um, and next, we have Larissa Danino with Picking County Public Health. She's going to speak about our latest and greatest um, mask ordinance. Welcome. Good afternoon. Thank you. 
I wanted to spend some time to just briefly go over the mask requirements as they kind of continue to change um, to make sure everybody has a, a good understanding of where we are with wearing masks. So right now in Pitkin County, the current requirements are that you have to wear a mask when you're entering or moving within any public indoor space and or while using or if you're waiting to use any public transportation service or non-personal transportation service, such as um, ride shares or buses. And of course, while outdoors, when maintaining a physical distance of six feet from another person who's not of the same household isn't feasible. Um, and you'll notice that that 10 minute uh, time frame has been removed. So that means that when you're outdoors and you can't maintain that six feet of physical distance, then you have to wear the mask regardless of how long that interaction is. So what does all that mean? I know it can get kind of confusing, so I wanna share with you some specific scenarios um, about when you should wear a mask. So if you're outdoors exercising, um, whether it be passing on a trail and you can't stay six feet from another individual, then you need to have a mask on. If you are exercising in an indoor gym facility, even if you're exercising by yourself, you're still in an indoor public space, so you need to have a mask on. And then also in all uh, common areas, such as elevators, hallways, break rooms, of course, if you're seated in a break room and you need to consume a meal, you can remove your mask to consume your meal during that time. So there are times when it is perfectly safe for you to remove your mask, and that is if you're working in an office with the door closed, you can have your mask off. But if someone does enter into the office, um, we ask that you put your mask on during that interaction. And then outdoors, if you are outdoors and you are away from other people and more than six feet from other individuals, please feel free to take off your mask and enjoy the beautiful outdoors that we have here. Um, and then while seated at a restaurant, um, if you do have to get up to go use the restroom, go speak to someone at another table, if you're moving around within the restaurant, um, you do need to have your mask on. But while you are seated at a restaurant, it is okay to have that mask off. So for businesses, what does this mean um, for mask compliance? Businesses are required to post signs at entrances that instruct customers that they must wear a mask when entering or moving around inside the business. And if a customer claims to be exempt for a medical condition or another reason, you are not allowed to, or, um, to ask for proof of the condition that they have that allow them to be exempt. Um, so, what does that mean too? If, you, if someone does claim to be exempt, well, there's some best practices that you can consider um, when, you, in, um, when you come in contact with those kinds of instances. So consider implementing alternatives to in-person service, maybe curbside pickup, contactless delivery, or assistance with certain services and products online. And then if a customer attempts to enter without covering, you know, try and communicate with them first to make sure that they understand what the requirements are. And if you have the availability of face coverings to provide to customers, then do so if you're able and then request that they put it on. If they continue to refuse to wear a face covering, then you are um, required to decline services to the customer or request that they not enter or they have to leave the premises. But of course, we want to work with customers as, um, as well as we can. So if they um, are a visitor and aren't necessarily aware of their requirements, then first share that information with them so that they understand. Um, that is all I have on maps. So I'll pass it over to Jordana next. Thanks, Marissa. Next oh, is I forgot about this one. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Jordana. I wanted to mention really quick, uh, you have mentioned, Dave mentioned it earlier, but the Aspen Mandatory Mass Zone um, this is effective as of tomorrow, and within uh, the zone specified there, you are required to wear a mask in all indoor and outdoor areas, um, with the exemption if you're in a motor vehicle or if you're seated for, um, for dining. But uh, keep in mind, this is regardless of if you're with someone of the same household or even if you are six feet from somebody, um, those, are no, those do not come into play here. So you have to have a mask on at all times within that zone, except for those two exemptions. Now I'll pass it over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Larissa. Welcome, Jordana. Thanks, Patty. Thanks, Larissa. Um, I'm Jordana Savella with Pitkin County Public Health, and 
I'm happy to talk with you today about the, the new guideline going into effect today um, around informal gatherings. So as of today, informal gatherings are limited to 10 individuals. Um, the reasoning behind this restriction is really we've been learning from the investigation team about where spread is happening in a lot of cases, and it's during these informal gatherings, barbecues, um, folks getting together. And so we're really trying to take this data to inform our public health order and our restrictions to prevent the transmission and spread of COVID-19 in the community. So what does this mean? Um, we still are allowing um, some events of uh, up to 50 people to, to occur, those that are these more formal uh, formal kinds of, of gatherings and, and planned events. And so if you're asking yourself, um, I have this, this event in mind that I'm planning, where, does I, where do I fit? Is it an informal event? Um, what does it require? What do I need to do? You can go to the, the website and reference this chart. So it'll walk you through, you know, if you've got an event um, that you're planning to have that has up to 50 people, requires a city, town, or county permit. Um, you'll need to file an event safety plan and submit your permit application, and that is still permitted to occur. Um, if the event is more than 10 people, up to 50, doesn't require a permit, um, you can think through these next three steps. So is it going to be hosted in a commercial space, so a hotel ballroom, um, somewhere that already has a facility event safety plan? Um, if that's the case, that kind of event is still able to occur up to 50 people. Um, does the event have a coordinator with a business safety plan on file? Um, if they, they do, this is what they do. They're an event coordinator um, or some kind of business who um, hosts or runs these kinds of events. Um, they would just need to file an event safety plan um, to, to have that kind of event occur. Um, but then if the event doesn't have a coordinator with a business safety plan on file, you, your event is going to be limited to 10 people or less. Um, I think what's important to understand here is thinking that, um, is knowing that the event coordinator is really a professional with that business safety plan on file who is responsible for the event safety plan compliance as their primary, primary role during the event. Um, so that's really their, their responsibility to make sure that all of those social distancing and hygiene and masking requirements um, are, are being met and maintained um, throughout the, the, uh, the event. So we thank you for, for adjusting to this and um, recognizing the, the importance of all following these, these guidances and guidelines um, as we continue to hopefully see that, that trend line um, bumping, bumping down over time. And I will pass that on now to Brian. Thanks, Jordana, <laughs> Larissa. Um, so I wanted to just introduce our new consumer protection team that we are just recently sending out into the field. We've got them all trained and um, feeling comfortable to go talk to businesses. Um, so me, Brian Doherty, I am managing this team. Um, I've lived in Aspen for about 12 years and, and um, love exploring our backcountry backyard and mountain biking and skiing and running and just feel like this is a really important part of this community. Um, and so we also have Tucker and Joanna as our two specialists that will be going out in the field, um, responding to complaints, and then also making general visits to all business types um, just to ensure that they're following guidelines as, we're, as required. Um, Tucker moved to the Valley about eight years ago from Washington, D.C., and is a really big sports fan, um, has a really short customer service experience, and um, really enjoys being a part of this small community um, and really getting out there. Um, Joanna Coffey, a born and raised local here in Aspen, um, really big skier and surfer, really likes to go hiking, and um, the really deep community ties um, to our area. So I just wanted to introduce every, everybody to um, these folks that you'll be seeing out around the county and as well every once in a while in Aspen. Aspen as well will have their own um, protection, health protection team 
which will be run by CJ Oliver and Natalie Pesdos. And they will have two staff members. Um, I believe one has accepted that offer at this time and they're waiting on acceptance for the second one. So we can move on to this next slide. And I just want to um, take a second to appreciate what Mitch and Laura and Linda have done for uh, the city um, in this uh, meantime while they've been trying to hire these uh, folks. They've done a really great job um, hanging in there. Um, so for our team, the goals of what we're trying to do um, to make sure that every business has submitted their COVID safety plan and that they're following these requirements within. Um, so this has been a major challenge for us currently is just getting that outreach out to every business type and that's out there and making sure that they're aware that they need to have this plan um, and that they need to know what's inside it and what they need to be following. Um, so we're either on the phone and also in person going out to these businesses to work with them to help them understand these guidelines. And um, especially for each specific business type because each business um, is gonna be slightly different whether they're retail or an office setting or um, a restaurant or anything above. Um, we're trying to make sure that we have uniform messaging for all the businesses. So when a patron does go to a restaurant, they are gonna have the same experience that they would have at any other restaurant in Pickney County um, with no exceptions. Um, and same with hotel as far as when you're walking in, you're wearing a mask, um, you're wearing a mask at all times unless you're being seated to eat while you're indoors. Um, and lots of other things like that. Um, Another portion of our um, job is going to be responding to these community concerns and complaints. Um, and we're trying to do those as quickly as possible and investigate those. And lastly, um, though we feel that our most important role is education for these businesses, it will um, end up possibly going into enforcement actions, which have been drawn out um, for businesses that have not been in compliance and have been refusing to make corrections that we have recommended that they correct in order to follow the public health order. We can go to the next slide. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about our complaint system. Um, so we have this website, if you go to um, Pickin County's website, there's the bar across the top for um, COVID information. So when you click that, it brings you to this page. And right at the top of it, we have report a public health violation. And if you click that, it brings up a form that you can fill out um, to specify where that violation occurred and what um, observations you saw and things like that. Uh, um, so we can go out and respond to those complaints um, because the county is large and we cannot be everywhere at once. We need the community's help to um, let us know where there are issues. Um, and if there are serious violations, um, we would consider a serious violation something that is uh, willfully and blatantly against the public health order, something like um, a large, like 150 person party in a, in a restaurant or uh, people dancing and doing all kinds of things without masks. Um, inside a building. Um, those would be some things that we would want the police to respond to immediately. And that is that number for the non-emergency line listed. Um, so the way this is working is that initial complaints are split up and they're either going to my team with Picking County or the outside of the city limits of Aspen jurisdiction. And the ones that are uh, located in the city of Aspen are being forwarded to the city team um, for initial contact um, as it goes progresses through the processes and they do need to um, have enforcement. Um, enforcement is happening through Picking County. So we will also be a, in the city of Aspen doing enforcement actions and um, business visits as well as the city's team. Um, team and the city's team are focused on issues with businesses. Um, we have, um, we see that it's a real big challenge to try to chase somebody down, not wearing a mask in a park or on a trail or something like that. 
And while we do appreciate those um, complaints, um, just make us aware of where these potential issues are happening for us to possibly have more enforcement or signage. Um, we are available to immediately respond to those types of issues. Um, our goal is to complete these investigations within 24 to 48 hours. So, and then, oh yeah, there's the, and then if you click again, there's gonna be another one that slides across. So we, we're talking about that, oh, one more. There it is. So business plans. Um, so you saw on that last slide, um, just below where you submit the complaint is um, business safety plans. When you click on it, it brings you to this page. Um, and obviously you click on this portion to submit your safety, your business safety plan. Again, I wanna reiterate all businesses that are open in Taking County need to have a business safety plan submitted. And along with that business safety plan, there are specific industry guidance that um, needs to be met as well. Um, and I have a brief list on the side here of the different um, industry guidances that we have created. And um, when you get onto this uh, business safety plan page, if you were to just scroll up, you would see links to every single one of these pages. It was just too large to fit on the screen. Um, but I just, yeah, I wanna remind everybody, um, we're still seeing a lot of businesses that do not have these um, business safety plans. And um, it's really important for you to be able to understand um, what requirements you're being held to as a business. And so we know that you understand when we are coming to these businesses to talk to you that uh, you've done your due diligence of what you're supposed to do. Um, that's about all I have had for this. Okay, thank you, Brian and Jordana and Larissa. Um, you guys are moving along. I really appreciate it. Uh, CJ with the City of Aspen, did you have some comments you'd like to present to us? I do. Thank you. Let me. Bring this up. Um, all right, so oh, one more click away here. I just kind of want to follow up briefly on what Brian had touched on, which is a number of the functions of our Aspen Health Protection Team. But our group is a, um, a small group of city specific staff that are handling the, many of the issues that Brian's talked about inside of the city of Aspen uh, city limits. And so our group is focused primarily on uh, education and business support. Um, our main goal is to keep businesses compliant and up to speed with whatever the sector specific guidance that relates to their business is. Um, we're going out and doing visits both in, in response to complaints as well as a lot of proactive visits to uh, city of Aspen businesses to make sure that they have um, a firm understanding of what the requirements are related to their business and if they don't, uh, providing that guidance to them. And also, as Brian mentioned, we're really working hard to try to make sure that our city of Aspen businesses uh, are in possession of a business safety plan that's applicable to their business sector. So that's really been the focus of our team. Um, the graph up here kind of shows the breakdown of some of our bigger areas of focus. Um, restaurants obviously being um, a big component of that, just because of the number of visitors, the number of restaurants, period, as well as general retail, gyms, um, educating about our mask ordinance out on the street and a host of other smaller uh, bits and pieces that kind of make up that pie chart. Our group is currently made up of a number of people who are working at, on this effort part-time because they're also employed as community resource officers and parking department directors and a number of folks. And as Brian had mentioned, I want to repeat, I really were very grateful for their efforts. Um, they've been able to do a lot. In the last month, we've conducted over 120 uh, site visits and community contact out in the community with that staff that are devoting a small sliver of their time to be able to make that work happen. As we move ahead, we're gonna be hiring two uh, full-time staff to work on this, so we're gonna significantly increase our capacity to be out in the community and have a presence um, and hopefully be able to get to compliance and make sure that we have business safety plans and businesses um, in a more efficient manner moving ahead because that will be our two new employees' primary focus. I don't yet have pictures of them. One of them is, is hired and will be starting work on the 6th of August and the other one we're still working out some details on. Um, but basically in the next couple, two to three weeks, we're planning to have significant more capacity in the city of Aspen um, and really help to support the efforts that Brian and his team are doing across the county. 
our folks aren't going to be handling enforcement actions specifically, but our team will be providing documentation for violations that they uh, observe out in the community and we'll forward that on to the enforcement team um, that's handling those actions. So our team is really kind of an absence specific addition to um, the work that Brian and Jordana and all of their teams are doing over in Pickens County and we're just focused specifically in the city of Aspen. And that's about it for me. CJ, thank you very much. Okay, now we're leading up to the Aspen Ski Company with Rich Berkeley and Steve Howard who are gonna to speak to us about steps the ski company is currently taking during the pandemic pandemic to plan for next ski season. So gentlemen, the floor is yours. Hi Rich, hi Steve. Patty, thank you. Um, so yes, first of all, let's just restate that our overall goal is to operate in a manner that protects the safety of guests, employees, greater community, and meets and exceeds all of the public health directives. Now uh, we completely understand that we cannot operate if there's a spike in hospitalizations and Dave, I was very pleased to see that it looks like we are accomplishing that goal. Before I start, I want to just do some quick rumor control. Um, I was hearing that we were not going to open all of the mountains either due to business or to, to bees, and that is false. We are planning on opening all of our mountains as we have scheduled, and um, Kaplan and I have been known to run lists if need be, so we will continue to do that. Rumor confirmation. Um, we are in this dichotomy of where we're hearing that we're going to be too busy at certain times and not busy enough in, say, January. Uh, January is going to be significantly impacted by a lack of international business. We are expecting international business to be almost zero. Um, and so we are aware of that, and we're working on steps to kind of modulate the season, address that a little bit further um, as far as how we're going to do that. Um, we don't know how other markets are going to fill in, but we do believe that Houston, Los Angeles, Kansas City might become dry markets. Uh, all of our on-mountain projects are on schedule. So snowmaking to the top of Aspen Mountain, the burn chair and snowmass, snowmaking on log deck, log pole and snowmass, and then um, the sun deck roof should be all complete with no issues. Uh, next week, we are putting on a new rope on the lift 1A chair list, so you'll see that project in town if you're there. For planning purposes, we've divided um, the planning into four teams and, and uh, areas of offering. There's external agencies and communications, operations planning, which probably is what deals with you guys the most, product and programming changes, and then technology and communications. For external agencies, uh, you are one of them. Uh, you know, County Health Board meetings now become must-see TV. Um, but we also are working with the governor's office, monitoring where they are, what their thinking is. We're also working with Colorado Ski Country and NSA to develop a playbook for a pandemic, ideally so that the entire ski industry has a unified front moving forward from Oregon to southeast for ski areas so that we're not all fragmented. Um, one of the areas that has become very important to us, which we not, wasn't really on our radar even three weeks ago, was school districts. Um, if the school districts are not in session, a uh, huge impact both to our employee workforce and then probably those kids will want to be on the hill at some point and that's a congestion area as well. We're also working with our ancillary partners, Challenge Aspen and ABSC being the others, uh, the big ones, but we also have about 100 other ones. And we're watching very closely what's going on in Eagle, Summit County, as you guys are, because what impact uh, Vail Resorts probably will come to Pickens County at some point. We're looking at ski area operations in South America and Australia, New Zealand. New Zealand currently leading the world in, in terms of how they're operating, um, but it's an island, it's closed, and it's all locals, and they have no confirmed COVID tests or cases. Uh, South American resorts, for the most part, haven't opened. We're also watching amusement parks and shopping malls since they're similar in nature to how we operate. Um, most of them are operating at very, very severely limited capacity. Most malls are still closed. And then we're keeping an eye on nationwide trends. We are very aware that we do not operate in a bubble. Um, what happens in the community and then even in the state will certainly impact our ability to stay open. Um, so we have these divided into those areas and we have teams working on each one. Um, I'm on all of them. Um, there is one currently meeting right now that I'm missing, so <laughs> I'll get an update. Um, operations planning. Um, as you probably noticed, everyone puts a timestamp now on operations. They say as of July 1st at 1 p.m. or whatever it is, and that's exactly what I will do. Um, we've been in operation 55 days so far, and it doesn't look like I was very pleased to see Dave's report on the hospital, which is our number one goal, as it stated, um, and we would like to continue that track record. So we're looking at every aspect of our operations from a kind of a pinch point 
and we're developing protocols for each department and area, geographic and department, you know, as a functionality. We're going to reduce the need and access for locker rooms, just so you all know. So you'll see a lot more employees in uniform before we can let you commute in a uniform or ride the bus. Um, and we are compartmentalizing teams where we can so that we have a positive case, uh, similar to what happened in the school district yesterday. And we can quarantine that group without impacting the entire operation. Um, our biggest pitch point, believe it or not, is turning us to transportation. And so we had a meeting with RASA and Dan Blankenship. And with the buses at the capacities they're at, we're going to be at a huge impact for both our employees getting to work and for guests getting to the mountain. So we're anticipating that we're going to see a lot more drive traffic. We don't have a lot of capacity in parking. Not sure how that's going to look. We're working on expanding anywhere we can as far and for parking. But we're also looking at expedited curbside drop-off and um, any way that we can expand our fleet, we'll certainly do that. Ticket offices, you've seen. I hope you guys have been by the, the Aspen Mountain Ticket Office and inspected it and that it's functioning as well. The lessons that we're learning from summer operations will certainly apply to winter and monitoring line flow seems to be the key um, there. Rental retail is in the similar boat. We actually have two retail operations open, um, one in Aspen and one in Snowmass and we're applying those. But what we're looking at for the winter will be anything that's touchless, home delivery, reservation systems, touchless waivers, outside payment and pickup and drop off, so those types of things. Rental retail certainly presents another pinch point, um, and so we're watching that. Mountain food and beverage is our third biggest pinch point. Um, limited capacity currently. We're probably focused on a lot more grab and go type menus. We will have, I don't think we're gonna have any sit down dining on Mountain next year. We're expanding spaces, we're tenting where we can, um, we're reopening facilities. I'm working with the team from the county under Suzanne Wolf to uh, look at roofing. Uh, Spider Savage at Snowmass very well becomes a restaurant and a tent. Um, Cafe West at the bottom of Buttermilk, every little warming hut becomes a picnic area. We're um, gonna have picnic areas all over the mountain. So think of Buckhorn Cabin is expanded in a socially distant format, top of Total Lock Park. Highlands will do uh, buttermilk. We'll have some there at the bottom of West. Um, bathrooms and warming facilities is our other big concern. And we um, obviously with capacity limits on the buildings, we're going to have bathrooms outside, but warming facilities is of concern. And we're going to be certainly communicating with both locals and guests on how that looks. Lift operations. Um, first of all, if we have the epidemiologists on the line, we would love to get as much information outside and socially distance as what we need to do but we're creating as much space as possible throughout all of our areas we're trying to spread pulses throughout the day so you guys know that on Aspen Mountain for whatever reason at 11 o'clock we always have a line even if it's 9 30 we didn't and at 11 45 we don't um, and that we're going to try and do everything we can we are looking at spreading pulses both throughout the day throughout the week and throughout the season so we may be asking locals to ski a lot more in early December than in the holiday season. We may have other uh, constraint, capacity constraints and limitations in place as well. Um, we know capacity is going to be limited. We don't know how much, um, and it, we hope it's not zero. Um, it's kind of what we're trying to do everything to prepare for. Some of the cabins, obviously, will be parties that know each other. Um, they'll be disinfected on every um, turn. That's currently what we're doing right now. And we are probably going to be looking at change in local skiing habits. So you may ski two creeks on afternoons versus other areas um, that you would normally do on a Saturday morning. Products and programming. And this is the biggest unknown. And here we feel that the longer we wait, the better idea we have of what we can actually offer for our guests and locals. Um, we've already delayed selling season passes till September. That could go beyond that, depending on how things look. No decisions other than that have been made at this time, but everything is on the table. Weekday passes we're looking at, staggered ski school, blackout, validation, um, incentives to ski mountains, you know, so maybe skiing buttermilk over snow mass on certain days. Um, but we recognize that skiing and snowboarding are fundamental to everyone in this valley, and our goal is to be as fair and as equitable for all users against all capacity constraints. And again, I reiterate, no decisions have been made. The group that I alluded to, that's the product and programming team, is meeting right now, and we're going to be hopefully having answers here in the next 30 days or so. The other, another area is technology and communications. And technology, we're going to try and do everything we can to prioritize, advance everything, sales, registration, waivers, fulfillment. Touchless credit card transactions, 
We have touchless menus in all of our restaurants. We have tech pickups so that you can come grab and go without touching anything. We're looking at tech to monitor crowds and lines and some way to get that to the guests so that if um, you knew that, like, for instance, Thailand's on a Saturday powder morning, probably not the best way to go, but we'll certainly get real-time information out as far as uh, how, how crowded it is. Um, communication, this is the last thing, is going to be key. And I'm working, I talked to a couple people at the county to see how the county does their text alerts. But some system along those lines that we can send it to a large body of people in a very short period of time, real time, so that we can control where we're creating congestion. Philosophically, we're looking at as many portals as we can. We're a very lucky resort. We have 13 base areas. And um, so we're probably going to be opening, for instance, two creeks as early as possible to relieve pressure at the um, base of uh, the VX or the gondola, um, campgrounds, lift one, all of the um, areas that we have that we can spread people across the mountains. Um, so letting guests and employees know what's going on is critical to um, any of our plans working. Uh, with communications, uh, keeping this group, the County Health Board, informed um, of our plans that basically change daily, I'm more than happy to present to you guys um, on a, whatever uh, schedule works for you in the future. But um, as we start to solidify some of these, I'll be happy to get back for you. Um, and then lastly, we are really committed to providing as much skiing and snowboarding as we can. We know this is not going to be a normal season, and we're asking, we're going to start asking for patience, flexibility, and understanding because there's going to be a lot of changes, and it's definitely not going to be business as usual. And we're doing everything we can to achieve that first goal, which is keeping the medical system free, protecting our employees. Addie, that's a record. Good job. Good job. And we, we understood every word you quickly said. I, I think I need to reach out and thank the ski company. Um, I know this is a big deal for the community and for many reasons to have a ski season. And I can't even imagine what the ski company is going through trying to figure out all these complex issues. But whatever Picking County can do and whatever the city of Aspen can do in Snowmass, I know this community will be glad to work with the ski company to see what we can do to help out and, and how we can encourage people to be flexible, patient, and understanding. So thank you. Thank you all. So in closing, I believe I can close now, Tracy. I again want to thank everyone for joining us today. I want to thank all of the people who spoke and for their, their concern and their patience for timeliness. And um, I think we are, can close the meeting unless Tracy, if you're still here, if you have anything more you would like to add. No, you guys were fantastic. Thank you so much. If anybody has slides they want to share with us, you can email those to me at tracy.truelove.pickingcounty.com and we'll include that in our recap. So thank Perfect. you so much. Great. Thank you all. And Grassroots, thank you. And to staff who's helped us, I want to thank you. And so we will be signing off until next week. Thank you all.